This book fell into my hands years ago while I was browsing the subterranean stacks of a university classics library. I was in a hurry, or so I thought, and as often happens with serendipitous finds, I was looking for something else. But this compact blue volume with gold lettering embossing a simple title caught my eye. I pulled it down and guessed that it had not been handled in decades, a mute voice in a musty wilderness. The book had a nice heft and was snug to the grip, and I began to flip through its pages. But the flipping soon became a slow perusal, with each page nudging me to the one before to see what I had missed so I might catch the current more securely and paddle downstream more smoothly. However musty the book, there was nothing musty about the message. This was bracing air from clear pine-covered uplands. Still, the book did not change my life at the time. I read it, found myself suitably impressed with its probity and clarity, and like all young people, went on to the next thing. Young men have much to do. But the book never quite left me, and one day I would return to it. A defense of classical education may in fact prove to be what is known in the literary trade as a sleeper, a book that appears, elicits light to modest comment, and falls into a long slumber, only to be awakened, as Shakespeare might say, ages hence by generations unborn and speaking in accents yet unknown. Though for this book, the sleep has been a coma. When I pulled it down from the shelf over 30 years ago, the book seemed a curiosity, albeit a serious one, and I inwardly cast my vote in the defense's favor. But I recall recommending it to no one. I couldn't imagine that anybody I knew would be remotely interested in the case it argued. But now, more than a century after its appearance and in the wake of a manifestly massive collapse on a global scale of the humane apparatus of education, particularly in the Anglosphere, this small but potent book may provide a life ring for all of us tossing in troubled waters. The book is both an argument and an artifact. Most certainly, it's a relic of its time, published as it was in Great Britain during World War I. And it was needed. The early decades of the 20th century saw restless ferment on both sides of the Atlantic raised against the grand old fortifying classical curriculum the centuries-long dominance of Latin and Greek in all the premier and otherwise ambitious schools and universities. The new agitation for usefulness and getting on as educational ideals of fitting young people for the modern world, which effectively meant applied science on the one hand and commercial business training on the other. If we're to teach languages at all, the thinking went, let them be modern languages, not the dead ones that not a soul in the world currently spoke or would ever speak again. Then, as now, the case was compelling. Surely education ought to set itself to the task of preparing a nation's youth for the rest of their lives, which meant, by and large, making people mutually serviceable in a practical world. The argument will ever be thus, and war always has a way of making practical people even more so. The world would have to become efficient or die trying. But a small fly landed in the ointment. Arguing the case for the opposition at this moment came Richard Wynne Livingston, an Oxford Don who believed he could see every day in his inky, meticulous work what were the civilized world's most urgent needs. He too believed in practicality, but his conception of the practical differed from those who worshiped the modern, and he was not swayed by those proponents of the great dilution to come that would, in the end, set back the cause of civilization by centuries. For Livingston lived by the long view. He was a classical scholar who would eventually become president of Corpus Christi College, Oxford, a co-editor for the Classical Review, and for a period after World War II, vice chancellor of the university. He might have had a perch in the ivory tower, and his manners might have been mild. But like a modern day St. George, he set out to joust with the new dragon. He well understood the arguments arrayed against classical education, but he found them all beside the point. 
This book is also an artifact of a time when the term classical education did not need defining, because everyone, including many amongst the uneducated, knew what it was. It was the fancy stuff done by the well-to-do, stiff-necked blokes. It was the high humanities, Latin, Greek, history, mathematics, geography, and a smattering of science where that was to be got. And not much else. French and German were welcome additions to such a narrow but intense curriculum, though they were not central, and many students got those on their own. But a classical education without Latin and Greek was unthinkable. Further, the book was written in a period when to be educated was an identifiable matter. A diploma or degree didn't make one educated. Being educated made one educated. If someone had been to school, one could tell. If someone had been to university, one could really tell. Of course, such things could be faked and parodied, but at least the faking and the parodying demonstrated that education of the old kind showed informed, if not always transformed, natures. And those enhanced natures, Livingston would have stressed, were earned, not bestowed, regardless of one's social class or natural talent. All education, both for those destined to be shop clerks and for those who were Oxbridge bound, was a tough apprenticeship, not a happiness or self-esteem project. School was too serious an enterprise for therapeutic tinkering. There were things to know, and even more important, things to become. And serious people must get down to the task. A task which began with accurate labeling. Livingston might not have seen the time to come when education would be deemed classical simply by dint of memorization drills and wholesome reading lists. He no doubt would have approved of both but he still would have inquired as to when students in a classical school were to launch into the languages themselves and how long it would take them to reach Homer and Virgil in Greek and Latin. The notion of classical as a rough synonym for alternative lay in the future. Classical light might make for a decent education, and it often does, but calling it classical would have been, to his mind, a lax usage. Nonetheless, there are two ways to think about classics or classical education when we use those terms to describe a curriculum. By pursuing the one, we engage with the Greeks and Romans through their history, literature, and philosophy so as to be informed of what they said and did and then imagine how we might better our own lives by the examples they set. In doing this, we are not so much learning about them as we are learning from them. The presumption being that, in many arenas of thought and action, they are our superiors. They speak and teach, we shut up and learn. This kind of classics and casual dress is a splendid way to embrace the classical inheritance and is likely ten cuts above any other approach that the secular West has devised, especially the shrunken, corrupted, and expensive sort reigning over the last half century and more lives can be enriched with this method. Yet, all the reading is done in translation. The other sense of classics, though, ideally includes all of this, and the student emerges just as knowledgeable, but with a difference. This approach requires the student to pay dues for that knowledge by several years of wrestling with the two classical languages themselves. A sweaty, protracted exercise in memorizing, concentrating, and applying accompanied by frequent tribulation. All this calling for long-suffering patience and, should the gods smile, tempered triumphs from time to time. But the rewards are much more profound. It is this sense of classics that Livingston both assumed and argued for. And it is what we might call classics in full dress. The first approach conveys formative knowledge and is well worth the effort expended. The second fosters the same formative knowledge, but brings in its long and arduous toe a heightened intimacy with that which is known. An intimacy that, firing on all cylinders, becomes itself transformative. This was the pearl of great price. But why Greek and Latin leads us to the anterior question of why Greece and Rome? Once more, 
those who would have taken the time to think at all on the topic a century ago, and certainly to have read this book, would have needed no explanations. The value of such an inquiry was filed under self-evident truths. Yet Livingston provides a fine brief in answering both questions. One just as valid today as it has ever been for the last millennium and a half. To study the achievements of Greece and Rome is to delve into the embryology of Western civilization itself. It's to turn the pages of a family album and see where we have come from. The Greeks taught us not only how to observe other peoples and ideas objectively, but also how to look in a mirror and see ourselves as we really are. They taught us not only how to observe, but also how to criticize ourselves. Greek thinkers of the pre-Christian era surveyed the entire landscape of experience and blocked off the foundations of the knowable world by staking out the very categories by which we still exercise our intellects. History, physics, mathematics, biology, botany, poetry, politics, ethics, metaphysics, and front the universe rationally while not presuming to efface its mysteries. The Greek poets and tragedians showed us how anguished souls can be imbued with nobility in the midst of agony and sorrow. They gave us a lexicon for our sufferings. And by their mastery of the arts of law and governance and military might, not to mention their especial capacity for emulating the best that the Greeks had given them, the Romans showed the world ever after how to assimilate the good of other cultures while retaining the essential virtues of their own and harness the staying power to last for a thousand years. A man who knows the origins of the world in which he lives, Livingston wrote, looks at it with more understanding, walks in it with securer and more certain steps. He is less intimidated by words, for he knows their history, less inclined to either excessive respect or contempt for existing institutions, for he sees how they came to be there. Here we have in one sentence the seeds of a prime argument for making ourselves responsible for knowing the past. We become better, wiser people. Also more decent ones. Full stop. Contrast this calm equanimity earned by deep reading, patience, and reflection to the demonstrations of banshee screaming routinely exhibited on college campuses in our own day, where students howl and hyperventilate with trite slogans over grievances they do not understand, and on the substance of which they probably could not pass a simple quiz. Some of them may have golden intentions, as many young people do, but most lack the intellectual formation even to build a rational opinion, which is why most of their opinions come to them already prepackaged and microwaved. They get to feel smart on the cheap. But the fault is not theirs. The fault lies with those who long ago discarded the intellectual traditions that could have given them something real and transcendent to live by and for. All of this was once manifest to intelligent people, especially in Livingston's time before the educated had become infected with the peculiarly sophisticated, progressively foul virus that was to spread over the coming decades of the 20th century and burden ordinary folk with the destructive notion that the new is always better, and that modern people stood to their ancestors as ubermenschen to gnats. As Livingston wrote those pages, Lenin was alive and plotting to spring a political pogrom in Russia that would not only upend a government, but also work a shift in the Western mind itself that was to be, in the end, not only intellectual, but spiritual. What the practical people had started in the 19th century Rabid ideologues, those posturing on editorial pages, dogmatizing in the academy, and bellowing in the streets, would finish in the 20th. After 1917, common sense and common decency alike were forced into the bunker, and the world had bigger problems to confront than the assault on classical education. The tide was going out. Still, a thin hope remained that the classical approach would survive once the war clouds cleared, though that hope was immediately frustrated in a newly dislocated world. But over a century after this book's publication, that hope has risen again with promises of a rebirth among the faithful.
Nonetheless, we must grapple with the blunt question as to why we ought to learn the languages themselves. Classics in full dress has never been a cause espoused by those whose idea of efficiency entailed a one-on-one -on -one correspondence between instruction and obvious application. Nor, we must add, has classics in casual dress. But for Livingston and the wiser minds of his time and times prior, studying the two classical languages made the best, most efficient use of time for those possessing even a smattering of intellectual talent, the curiosity to feed that talent, and the discipline to serve both. And while these languages can be fruitfully acquired at any age, intimacy with them can exercise a formative function only for the young, who stand most of all to be forever stamped deeply with their rewards. The high palisade of languages, unlike our own, Livingston writes here, must be surmounted when young, or it will almost certainly never be surmounted at all. So why Greek and Latin? Not simply because they're there, not merely because they're traditional, but because, as Livingston wrote, the best revelation of the Greek genius is the Greek language, fine, subtle, analytic, capable of feeling and expressing the most delicate minutiae of thought. And Latin, with its logical rigor, provides a boot camp in precision and verbal richness, as well as a gateway into the study of other languages, including English and all the Romance tongues. And any gateway into language is a gateway into fuller life. And since our object is, or ought to be, to train exactness of thought, and to develop intellectual concentration, we need the finest vehicles on the road to take us there. These two languages, as our civilization has known for two millennia, are the languages of Homer and Horace, Sophocles and Virgil, Plato and Cicero, Aristotle and Saint Augustine. To learn any language is to begin to breathe the native air of its speakers and to tap into the wellsprings of their thought and experience. Intellectual benefits accrue, vocabulary expands, perception sharpens, grammar liberates. But it is also to become habituated to the contours of reality, to begin to see the world as it is, not as utopians and other overheated agitators would have it be. And it is, in its higher reaches, an entree to greatness and thereby, for any student, an inducement to patience and humility in the daily struggle with clear and constant examples of superior perception and utterance. No mean achievement in an age of creeping inarticulacy, what we might call the new illiteracy of the instructed. With such a tuition of the intellect, our mental muscles become lean, our persistence is strengthened, and we begin to measure and weigh our words and ideas as though they mattered, because they do. Human nature is sleepy, Livingston tells us, and there's nothing like plowing through the labyrinths of meaning and sense required by translating even one paragraph or one sentence out of or into one of the classical languages to administer an ice bucket over the head. Whatever else students of classics may be when fully in gear, they're awake. Reading this book now will pose a challenge to some, especially the first section, where Livingston dives into public matters of his own time, as well as the last, where he speculates on possible reforms called for by circumstances in the United Kingdom of a hundred years ago. Several references may need chasing and allusions explaining, but not many. Further, for some readers, the book may feel parochial, more like the parlor talk of a leisured class than serious academic discourse. But that is a virtue. We must remember that it was written for a wider public, for professors, pedagogues, and intellectuals, yes, but just as much for anybody who is charged with the education of souls, which includes, most particularly and critically, parents. And for this reason, this book can still be read with ease, because one salient quality of the classically educated has always been their clarity. The arguments here have aged well. Indeed, they have aged better than their counter-arguments. 
Though perhaps that is only because we see the world those counter-arguments have led to. This is a time-tested roadmap toward intellectual cultivation. In the new age dawning of artificial intelligence, here is a case for enhancing real intelligence within human souls. Livingston may speak from what seems like an Olympian height, but so must anybody who appeals to the permanent things instead of the obsessions and distractions of the passing moment. How many pundits and protesters vituperating over democracy even know where that idea came from, or how it was practiced, or what its weaknesses were? Over a century after its publication, a defense of classical education reads more freshly than most books churned out today and stuffed with all the cliches, both plainly apparent and cleverly hidden, of the superficial, educationally defective, intellectually impoverished, and spiritually desiccated postmodern mind. This book provides a path to a rekindling of pedagogical and intellectual sanity. Its truth quotient remains high. May the restoration come. Thank you.